I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, her name is Dr. Kathleen Hamm. She is a surgeon at um, UF College of Veterinary Medicine. And tonight she's going to be presenting a lecture on wound management. Dr. Hamm, floor is yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Simmons. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, does that work? Yeah, that looks good. All right, excellent. All right, well, thank you so much for having me today and um, or tonight. And uh, I look forward to talking about wound management and some bandaging techniques and things with you guys. Depending on you know how we go along here, um, we can also go through some case examples and talk about um, some strategies otherwise. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A button and we can certainly stop midway and talk about something. Um, feel free to, to interject as, as, as you can. I know obviously it's not as easy when we're in person, but, but we can still try to make it um, a little less formal. All right, so wounds. I, I love managing wounds, but, um, but they are very, very um, trying at times. And, and I always try to go back and think about, you know, what, you know, what, what are we trying to accomplish with these wounds? And so um, this is a quote that I like. Uh, the primary goal of wound care is not the technical repair of the wound, but it is providing the optimal conditions for the natural reparative process of the wound to proceed. And so, you know, I think we oftentimes get super hung up on how we're gonna close it. Um, and oftentimes we need to just provide it supportive care. And, um, and, that, and that can help me stay focused at times as well. Wounds, of course, there's no perfect algorithm. You know, uh, what works one day may not work the next day. So you definitely have to be adaptable and it can be rewarding and sometimes frustrating, frustrating for you um, when you have something working and then all of a sudden it stops. So frustrating for your, you know, your nurses and staff, because sometimes these can be time consuming, a little labor intensive, um, frustrating for owners, because what I always um, preface these conversations with is that it can oftentimes be you know, a bit of a roller coaster. And it can be costly um, because it, it is, it's sometimes a slow process uh, or sometimes it may require multiple surgeries. And, and so making sure that communication happens up front with the clients to set the right expectation. But the thing is, is wounds heal. And, and, and so if you remember that and you stay positive um, and, you, and you continue to stay focused and listen to your wound, then you're gonna, you'll end up growing to love them maybe as much as I do. So um, we'll go through um, various steps. Um, uh, again, the goal is to heal the patient as fast as possible. And in doing so, we can try to minimize complications keep that cost down and then minimize morbidity to your patient. So, you know, in this picture, you have uh, an animal that has multiple large wounds. These wounds are going to be effusive. They're going to be painful. So you have to think how best are we going to manage these types of cases? How fast can we get this patient closed? But if we close it too fast, maybe it will fall apart. So, you know, finding that right window is, is definitely going to be an important factor as well. So how do we make that decision? You know, what's the process that's going through our heads as we are presented with these wounds? And uh, I break it down, you know, into big, big chunks, big categories, certainly patient factors. So, uh, you know, if an animal has diabetes, um, or if they're malnourished. So you're seeing an animal that, um, <clears throat> that maybe, uh, you know, has, has been in a, um, an abuse situation or something, or let's say you have a down animal and they've got a pressure sore, you know, so these are some factors that you've got to take into consideration when you're choosing how to manage that wound. Um, and what the potential for healing is in that patient. So if you do have a patient that has a higher risk of developing infections and poor wound healing, you're going to progress super slow in that. You're not going to expect to suture everything up and just have it heal instantaneously. 
You're also going to think about the degree of contamination and oftentimes when we have traumatic wounds, which is what we see most most frequently in our in our um, small animal patients, they're usually either contaminated or dirty. So um, we tend to think of the, the wounds that are less than six hours as being contaminated. Greater than six hours, they have an active infection, so they're considered dirty. But every once in a while, you'll see some of those chronic wounds too. We won't talk as much about those, um, but those are, you know, say your pressure sores, um, weird draining tracts and things like that. Um, we are going to talk a lot about the mechanism of the wound. So how does that wound form? Because that can really help predict how contaminated it's going to be and how deep some of those wounds are. And when we have wounds with certain types of forces, we're going to have um, the greater potential for ischemic injury and ongoing tissue death. So um, that's going to help us determine, you know, the time at which we might want to think about closing that wound. And then we're going to talk about wound assessment. So obviously you can't close a wound unless it's ready to be closed. And so um, we'll talk about some indicators that we can use to help us um, determine when a good time to close is. So um, some outcomes, some things that, you know, hopefully at the end of this, you guys will will be thinking about, um, you'll think about the forces that cause wounds, the mechanisms of the wounding, um, parts of the wound, wound assessment techniques. We won't go a whole lot into wound healing because um, it's kind of, you know, it's really neat, but it's a little bit boring. We'll touch on it a little bit here and there. So um, I don't like physics at all. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so it pains me sometimes to think about the actual forces that are used in creating wounds, but it, but it is very, very helpful. And so we'll talk about these four, these four forces. Um, and the reason again, that we talk about those forces is because the types of force are going to have somewhat predictable mechanisms at creating certain sized wounds, depth, of wound, degree of contamination, and then that damage to the surrounding tissue. So, um, so when we think about um, the force with the least amount of energy, it's a friction force. And so essentially it's like surfaces moving across one another. And these tend to be, again, small amounts of energy so they're gonna cause very superficial injuries, oftentimes partial thickness. So road rash is a good example. Um, and, and with that, pretty mild contamination. The contamination is not going to be um, terrible in those cases. And then we have shear forces and shear forces, you have a little bit more energy here and the force moves parallel with the tissue. And um, the size of that wound can somewhat be dependent on the pressure that's exerted um, and also how sharp the object is that might be causing that um, shear force. So a good example of this is a laceration. So an animal running through the woods and they run against um, a stick and that stick it causes a laceration. That's typically a shear force. Um, so again, because it's a smaller amount of energy, usually minimal damage to the surrounding tissue. Um, and again, mild contamination. So, um, so shear forces. And then we have tension forces. Uh, this is where we have a striking force at an ankle, and what that what that does is it pulls or stretches your tissue, and these often are high energy. So these are your hit by cars, um, uh, some of your bite wound injuries, and this creates a big flap of skin um, or an avulsion. So these are where we get our pockets, um, and it causes moderate to severe damage to your surrounding tissue because because you have that big high amount of energy, and when you have that damage to the surrounding tissues, you get ischemia, you get infection, and these are oftentimes moderate to severely contaminated wounds. And then finally, the fourth force that we talk about is the compression force. And this is where we have a striking force. So again, some hit by cars, some bite wounds are good examples of these. And these are again, high energy with moderate to severe trauma to your tissues um, and then moderate to severe contamination. So, um, so as we've moved along that path, we get worse and worse along the way.
So now let's take and look at a breakdown of the mechanism of wounding. And then we can think about the forces that cause each of those types of wounds. Um, again, most commonly we think about mechanical wounds. And these are our acute traumatic wounds that we see very frequently in our, in our small animal patients. Um, certainly we see chemical and toxin um, types of wounds, thermal injuries, pressure sores, radiation um, burns, and then draining tracts. And so um, we won't focus a lot of those. We're just going to mainly talk about those mechanicals. So we'll break down each one of those. So Abrasion wounds. Uh, these are, again, that friction force. Road rash is a good example. It's usually a partial thickness. And what that means is um, if you just shear off part of your dermis, you still have some of the deeper dermal layers intact. And so within that deeper dermal la layer, you're going to have sweat glands, you'll have hair follicles. And what's really neat is the cells from those adnexal structures actually come and cause um, epithelialization straight from there. And so that's called um, adnexal wound healing. And that's a really neat phenomenon. So when you're managing abrasion wounds, road rash and things like that, you want to keep the area clean. So you really just try to protect it and bandage it or put a t-shirt on them. Um, but just, you know, keep them, keep them clean and the body's usually going to heal those guys up pretty quick. Um, when we have laceration wounds, again, that's that shear force. Um, the, there can be some variation in size depending on the mobility of the skin that can sometimes affect and make that laceration a little bit bigger um, in terms of the, the, the area. Um, but if it's on an area with less mobile skin, say like the extremity, um, usually it's not going to have a big flap of skin or anything. These again, usually have my, uh, minimal contamination, minimal damage to surrounding tissues. Um, although you can certainly see bleeding if a blood vessel was lacerated. So these wounds, laceration wounds, if you're catching them in that Time frame of you know less than six to eight hours. Um, these are candidates for good primary wound healing. You know, so where you can close those guys, um, clean the area, minimal debridement, and and go ahead and get those guys stitched up. Um, now, some exceptions to that would be if the laceration lacerated a tendon, um, and you need to make sure you're doing the tendon repair properly before you close it. Um, if you have a body wall penetration, because in those situations, you're going to have to explore. If you have massive hemorrhage, typically indicating that you've got a big vessel that's lacerated and you need to get that ligated before you can close. And then we do see lacerations with bite wounds. And so you have to take caution in closing those primarily, because maybe there's an area that has a nice laceration, but then you've got some deep pressure wound, uh, puncture wounds um, from that compression force as well. Um, uh, we see our degloving or avulsion wounds, you know, however, whichever word you like to use most often. And this is where we get tension force. And um, so again, hit by car is a really good example of this. So the skin is caught on an object while moving. And what we see um, is that the skin separates from its subdermal attachment. So these are where we get these these wounds with these big pockets. So you have a dog bite attack, they bite and then they pull um, and it separates the skin and you get these big large pockets. Um, and they can oftentimes be pretty extensive um, and they don't always have to be very deep in these, in, um, in these uh, avulsion wounds, but usually it's high energy. So you're gonna have a large amount of contamination and, and ongoing death. And one of the areas that you're gonna be most concerned about with these avulsion wounds is the skin. Because if we go back to think Thinking about the blood supply to that skin, um, the skin gets its blood supply from direct cutaneous arteries that come up, and then they traverse in that cutaneous trunk eye muscle. And in these degloving and avulsion wounds, that skin gets separated from that cutaneous trunk eye. So that skin oftentimes dies. So these are wounds where you don't want to close them. You need time. If you close that big flap of skin down, 
it may die. And then now you're dealing with um, a wound that is got dead skin and, and and whereas if you managed it open, you would have monitored and, and debrided as you went along. <clears throat> so, um, so definitely take caution in that. Avulsion injuries can be categorized as either a mechanical or a physiologic. Mechanical just means that there's an open wound there with it. So, you know, you've got this big flap of skin that comes off. Um, and again, we want to do open wound management. These are cases you're going to manage open and then either a delayed primary or second intention healing, depending on where in the body and what your options are. Physiologic degloves, these happen when you um, have that separation, but there's no wound yet, and you don't develop the wound until the skin starts to die. And, you know, so sometimes we can again see these with dog bite wounds um, where they're they're picked up and they're they're shaken and and maybe the the puncture from the teeth didn't actually um, go all the way through the skin, but the 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 tension force still separated that skin off. And so that skin may subsequently go on and die. So again, open wound management, serial debridement, um, and then you're going to do a delayed primary or second intention, depending on what your options are in those situations. So what about the shear wounds on extremities? Um, this is again, that tension force. Um, and so these are, you know, when the animals get hit by car, they get run over and then you have that shear right across the extremity, you know, right across the, the digits and the metacarpals or metatarsals and, and these, you know, oftentimes um, are going to have pretty significant orthopedic injuries that, that have happened concurrently. Sometimes it looks like just a saw, you know, just ground, you know, like shaved off a chunk there. Um, and so because of that, they're deep, they go down into joints. They usually are involving muscles and tendons, um, and they're highly contaminated. And, you know, that foot was just drug across the cement. Um, and we anticipate that there's definitely going to be, um, you know, ongoing tissue injury because of um, the amount of force that was used to, to, to create that wound. Um, and these are certainly wounds too, where you're gonna be very cautious in evaluating um, the neurovascular bundles going to the distal portion as well, making sure that it's, it's gonna be alive. Um, when you have a shear wound on your extremity, these are open wound management. And um, even if you do have a flap of skin, um, I, I strongly advise that you don't try to close or suture. 100% tension is going to be something that will get you into trouble. And on extremities where you have a shear injury, oftentimes you've lost at least a portion of skin. And the last thing you want to do is create a biologic tourniquet by trying to suture something. So um, a lot of times we let these heal by second intention. It's amazing what the body can do, um, but sometimes we might choose to put a graft on to heal them a little bit quicker. Um, and then obviously whatever orthopedic injuries they have, they might need something else. It's pretty amazing at how some of these, you know, digit fractures and <clears throat> phalangeal um, luxations and things like that will just fibrose and heal with the with the open wound management from just, you know, all the bandaging that takes place regardless. Puncture wounds. Um, it is amazing what dogs are willing to um, impale themselves on. Um, it, it really is. Um, so puncture wounds, we typically think of a penetrating injury with a compression force. Um, it oftentimes may still be present. And in those cases, don't pull it out. You want to do use surgery to, to um, actually incise down to where that object is and then pull it out that way. Um, oftentimes the external wound is quite small, but they can go very deep and they may enter body cavities or puncture things that are very important. And they're going to be highly contaminated because, you know, obviously, um, as that's been driven in, um, the, the object itself is pretty dirty and now it's, um, it's uh, you know, contaminating all the tissue that it's touching. <clears throat> 
Um, so, you know, depending on when these occur and how quickly you're able to see these, sometimes you can do a surgical explore, um, remove the object, debride anything that doesn't look good, um, and close those primarily. And sometimes you're going to have to leave them open. So, um, so that's going to vary. Um, but some really important principles. Um, when you have a puncture wound over the abdominal cavity, you need to do an abdominal explore. And one of the common mistakes that I, that I think happens is people think that you're, you need to explore from where the puncture wound occurs. If you, if you find that your puncture wound goes into the abdominal cavity, you're going to then just do a xiphoid to pubis celiotomy. So you're going to go right on midline. And, you know, so this is an example here where you can see these puncture wounds that were up dorsal um, in the body wall, but this, but what we've done is a ventral midline celiotomy. So, so again, we're going to then go in. And the reason that we're going to always explore those abdominal wounds is because sometimes it's caused a rent in the mesentery, or it's actually punctured a hole into the intestine, um, you know, or a hole into the bladder or something along those lines. So you need to get in there and you need to assess to see if an organ system that normally has the potential for bacteria or toxin is leaking, that you're able to fix that at the same time. And then, and then you're going to go ahead and close the body wall. And then normally at that point, you're going to manage the open wound on the skin, um, you know, open, you're probably not going to close that per se. Now the difference is with cervical, um, or sorry, thoracic wounds. Um, when you have a puncture wound that goes into the thoracic cavity, we don't always necessarily jump in to explore the chest um, because even if the puncture wound punctured a lung, um, the lung doesn't have bacteria or any sort of toxin in it. So, um, so you don't have to go right into surgery to explore those. The caveat to that would be is if you had a um, animal that then was continuously leaking air um, from that puncture wound, or if they had hemorrhage that they couldn't control, sorry. Um, and so, um, so if you had something in some situation like that, then you would, um, then you would need to get into the chest. But otherwise, oftentimes with chest uh, thoracic wounds like that, you're going to put a chest tube in and, um, and, and manage it with a chest tube until you determine whether or not they need to be explored. Cervical wounds we see all the time, unfortunately, right? Because those are the situations where we have um, dog bite wounds very frequently. And, you know, the big thing with that is just very cautious, explore. Um, I do like to intubate those guys just in case um, we get down and, and um, we're close to the trachea. Um, and, um, and, you know, typically we anticipate that with cervical bite wounds, we oftentimes see um, a decent amount of subcutaneous emphysema. And um, most of the time we presume that there are small little tears in the trachea that's causing that subcutaneous emphysema. It is very, very rare that we ever have to actually fix anything in the trachea. Um, every once in a while, we'll have a laceration that's big enough or an avulsion or something like that. But most of the time, um, when you explore those cervical wounds, um, if you have a little bit of subcutaneous emphysema, don't get too worried about that. Um, and then, you know, to top it all off is bite wounds by far, um, the worst of the worst. I hate dog bite wounds. Um, and we see them every single day, unfortunately, and they can be very, very tragic cases sometimes, um, because these guys can become very systemically ill um, in, in their response to some of these bite wounds. And so, um, so it, can be, it can be pretty difficult to manage some of these cases. Bite wounds combine all the forces. So you've got shear, compression, tension, um, all that stuff. And um, oftentimes, unfortunately, we might have small puncture wounds on the outside um, with very, deep injuries on the inside. And, you know, people often say tip of the iceberg when they talk about these, these bite wounds. Um, and again, keep in mind that some of these may penetrate by cavities, they're highly contaminated, and there's typically going to be ongoing tissue injury. So um, I definitely um, 
uh, tell you guys to use caution when closing these primarily. Um, you really need to think about um, some factors that we'll talk about here in a minute, um, but more often you're gonna use open wound management and then maybe a delayed primary closure. So just to summarize, you know, what we've talked about so far, we talked about the wound mechanisms. So define how the wound was created, consider the forces that were generated, use all that to predict your degree of contamination, risk of infection, risk of tissue death, and then, and then decide how to manage. And so, um, so some take home tips from that. Don't close a wound if it has very large pockets. Don't close a wound if it's very deep and don't close a wound if it's greater than eight hours. So those are really good just um, hallmarks to live by um, because in those situations, you're likely to deal with um, complications if you close the wounds too soon. So um, we're gonna uh, move on from that and then we're gonna talk about how we close the wound, um, you know? So um, again, if we go back to thinking about our goals, our goals are to get this patient healed as fast as possible, you know? So, you know, what are our options? We can primarily close the wound. So that means we do it, you know, within that 24 hours. And really we have to be fairly strict at drawing a line for the ones that we're gonna close primarily. Minimal contamination and tissue damage you need to have adequate, healthy tissue available. So a lot of times, again, if it's on the extremity, primaries off the table. Um, and if it was a tension or a compressive force and you have deep pocketing, um, deep wounds, primary is gonna be off the table. So then in that situation, you're gonna do what's called a delayed primary. So you're gonna manage it open for about three to five days. And this is, you know, for those cases that have mild to moderate tissue damage and contamination. And this delay allows you to drain that wound and have improved tissue resistance to infection. So you're going to make that tissue as healthy as possible so that when you do close it, you're going to minimize the risk of it falling back apart. So, so that's what our goal is. Again, minimize that morbidity to your patient. So um, tension. Tension leads to ischemia, which leads to necrosis, um, which leads to dehiscence. And if tension is too great, it can cause a biologic tourniquet effect. And so this is a dead leg from having an, you know, a wound closed and it was too tight. Um, so this is definitely what you want to avoid. Um, and so anytime you have a wound on the extremity, unless uh, the only time you'd want to close it, if it was a nice laceration, but if it was a sheer injury, you're not going to go ahead and close those guys right away. So then finally, what are the other options if we're not going to do primary or delayed primary, we can do tertiary. And this is where we are waiting greater than five days. So now we're going to have plenty of granulation tissue develop. So we're going to really be giving this lots of time to progress along that wound healing path. So we've probably exited that inflammatory phase and we're well into that repair phase. And you're going to choose this when there's been extensive tissue damage, when there's been invasive infection. And so you're going to want to make sure you've given it plenty of time to manage. And, um, and then you close after you have a healthy granulation bed. If you have adequate tissue, you can just sew it back together. If not, maybe you're going to move some skin around with a flap or something like that. And then finally, second intention healing, which is pretty incredible. There's no doubt about it. So now you allow that repair phase to, to, to close the wound. So you have um, epithelialization that occurs around your wound edges um, and contraction from your myofibroblasts and, um, and that wound will eventually heal itself. So um, we do this in situations where we definitely have dirty or infected wounds, um, where you have lack of skin, um, and then the body takes care of it all on its own. So, you know, you can have really big wounds. Um, and as long as you're supporting that wound, you can see in this case, we've got beautiful, healthy granulation tissue here. If we look at our wound edges, you can actually see epithelialization occurring. And then this is the wound a few weeks later when you've had contraction and continued epithelialization. And now we just have this tiny little bit left here. So um, again, 
wounds heal and you know if you can support it and you can give it time um you typically are going to be able to get that that sucker to close for you eventually so take home tips um determine which wound closure you're opting for you know you don't have to you don't have to put yourself in a box you have you know sometimes you'll, you'll need to be flexible um and then don't close defects on extremities so those would be the take home tips from that so now we're going to just define the parts of the wound um, and go through some wound assessment techniques um, whenever we see these patients because wounds again can be super overwhelming and some you know some some folks don't like to manage wounds at all and that's okay um some of us like to manage them and so um they don't seem quite as daunting but but the but the situation can be very intimidating you have an animal come in and they have a giant wound and you have to figure out how am i even going to assess this because all you think about is how am i going to close this how am i going to close this and and don't jump to that just yet don't you know you need to think about it but first do your wound assessment and really define what you've got going on before you get too overwhelmed. So wound assessments, definitely do these guys under sedation or general anesthesia. Always use aseptic technique when you're doing your, your wound assessment and then try to make sure you've got consistent documentation. So um, parts of a wound, and this is obviously a really ugly picture, um, but um, essentially what we wanna think about, um, we wanna think about if we're just looking at a cross section of the wound here, our peri wound skin. So what does that look like around there? What does the wound edge look like? What does the base of the wound or the, the wound bed look like? And then what tissues are involved? Do we have subcutaneous tissue, fascia, muscle? We wanna know, do we have pocketing? How deep does our wound go? So these are all the, 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 the terms and the specific areas that we wanna look at. And we wanna be very clear in describing. And oftentimes, you know, we talk about those things, but we may not, consistently talk about them and I recommend that you try to you try to use a either a wound sheet or something that allows you to make that a little bit more consistent. So um, so we're going to go through uh, the various components and talk about these these parts peri wound skin wound bed the wound edges the depth and the pocketing so. Um, uh, when you're describing the wound, definitely describe the anatomic location on the body and then measure the size of the wound. It is really nice to document that. And when you do have wounds where there are multiple punctures, so those dog bite wounds and things like that, um, don't measure each individual tiny little puncture. All those wounds are typically connecting to each other. So just measure it as one big wound. And that allows you to ease easily um, just kind of listed as one because it's it's really you're going to manage it as one big wound. Um, there are um, little rulers that you can get that are just tearaway rulers that you can use. And sometimes this can be nice when you're um, managing a wound and, and waiting to see if you're looking for contraction or epithelialization, especially if maybe your wound's been static for a little while. Um, but these can be nice um, and you can order these. Oftentimes, if you just go to some um, conferences when we whenever we get to go back to conferences um, and you walk around the the um, the exhibit hall, uh, a lot of the wound companies have these um, have these as samples as well. When you when you probe your depth, um, you can use like hemostat or I like to use Q-tips um, and do a nice circular probing. And you're going to be probing again those some of those subcutaneous pocketing. You're going to probe the depth as well. So how deep does it go into your tissue? You can use a clock face to then describe and say, you know, I've got a a six centimeter pocket, you know, at nine o'clock. Uh, describe the structures that are exposed. Um, and that's going to help you um, to 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 know you know what type of into, you know outcome you're expecting from what's been damaged there. Uh, peri wound assessment. So we need to make sure we're assessing that peri wound skin because again, if we try to close a wound before that skin is ready, 
to heal, it's going to fall apart. We're going to have complications. So we want to look at the color, the texture, the temperature, integrity, um, see if it's painful. Because if we have evidence of infection, if you have cellulitis, you, if you try to close that wound, you're going to end up having a wound that falls apart on you. So, um, so take and really get a good look at that peri wound skin. And then when you're doing your bandage changes, you want to look to see what sorts of exudate are in the wound, because we know that that wound is going to be making all kinds of fluid. And so we describe it. Is it serosanguinous? Is it purulent? Is it, does it have that green color? Is it malodorous? You know, so describe all of those things when you're doing your, um, your documentation. And then quantity. And obviously, we can't measure the amount of fluid that's in there, but try to be consistent. So when I do my bandage change, you know, I'll say, okay, I'll put four lap sponges here as my dry layer. And when I change the bandage, if all four of those lap sponges are soaked, then I'll write that down. And then the next bandage change, I'll look to see if all four are soaked again. So I can, I can at least watch trends to see is the quantity of that fluid reducing with time. Then we certainly want to talk about if there's any necrotic tissue and, um, you know, and these are especially important in the cases where we, in, where we expect to see that ongoing tissue death or um, in injuries where, you know, there's been some compromise to the, to the, to the um, blood flow to the area. Um, whether that be, this is a burn case. This is a dog that has um, big eschars after sustaining um, some burns, um, but whatever that mechanism is. Those wound edges tell us a lot too. So um, the keratinocytes that are on the edge of that wound are going to need to proliferate and then they're gonna have to migrate. So you have to have healthy granulation tissue and you have to have the wound edges actually adhere down to the wound bed. And, um, and if they're not adhering or if they're rolling under, then you're not going to get that epithelialization taking place. Um, sometimes what we'll do is we'll maybe suture things down to the wound bed to help it, or maybe bring things closer in, um, in approximation, even though we know we can't maybe bring the, the edges together. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you look at the picture here, you can see you have really thickened edges. They're they're not adhered. Um, some of them are, are um, really fibrotic looking. So in cases like this, you know, these are probably not going to progress to heal. We might need to actually excise these edges to stimulate this to start healing. Um, that there might be some cell signaling that's going on that's causing this to stay more in an inflammatory situation. Um, and, and now you're not getting that progress, the progression to healing. So if you see a situation like this, you're going to want to culture the wound bed. Um, you might want to think about doing some debridement um, and, um, and, and see, or changing, you know, changing whatever you've been doing. So if you've been using one protocol, um, you might change your primary layer and try a different protocol moving forward. The wound bed, again, we talked about describing your supporting structures. And then once you get to that repair phase of wound healing, we want to talk about the granulation tissue and what the granulation tissue looks like. Is it covering the whole wound? Um, is it healthy? Um, is it a normal amount? So in this case, this is a dog um, that has um, a radiation burn. And you can see the granulation tissue looks terrible. It's white. Um, it even has a little bit of like a yellow color in some areas, maybe where there's some, um, you know, um, uh, unhealthy tissue that's there as well. Um, it's very thick around the edges, very fibrotic. So, you know, this is a wound that's not showing any indication of healing. You know, we can look at this right away and I can tell you that this wound is not going to heal anytime. Um, so we have to then take that into consideration and in deciding how we're going to manage something if, if the wound is telling us that it's in a, in a delayed state.
Um, so again, thinking about documentation, I like to use wound, um, wound assessment sheets when I do my bandage changes. I can have the nurse or student um, check things off um, as I'm doing my assessment or maybe I'll fill it in afterwards. Um, but it allows me to kind of just consistently go through and describe that wound. Um, and and um, I like check off sheets that way I don't have to write things and people don't have to read my handwriting either. Um, and we can put these in our electronic medical records as well. Um, some other things to take into consideration, you know, in practice, um, thinking about things like sedation protocols and um, and when you have a patient that's going to be getting an ongoing wound um, management, um, you know, what I like to do is actually on that documentation sheet, there's, I write here sedation protocol. Um, and so then I can document whether or not they had a good response to the sedation or if they didn't. And, and that can be really nice because then I can just keep going with the same one if it works. Um, scheduling, what I, what I find works best for me when I have patients with wounds. Uh, I have those clients drop the animals off in the morning and I tell the clients that I'll call them when I'm done with it. And that way I can fit it in in between appointments or um, at a time where I have a little bit more flexibility. I hate scheduling a bandage change as an appointment and I think it throws everything off and uh, causes a lot of frustration. So um, I think drop-offs work a lot better. And again, that client education is going to be super important. So making sure you're talking to those guys about the, um, you know, the ups and downs and the ongoing um, process and um, prepping them for, you know, for the whole, for the whole, the whole big picture. So take home tips, uh, control infection prior to closure. Peri wound skin tells you a lot about whether or not it's time to close that wound and document, you know? Um, and that's especially nice too when you work in a multi-doctor practice. Um, it is so nice when uh, I come on service and I'm taking over a wound and I can just go to the last um, uh, wound assessment sheet and I know what sedation protocol is working for them. I can see that they've submitted a culture on it and then I can see, you know, what the most recent measurements were and, and it really helps me then, you know, take my interpretation from that time and compare it to how things have been going as well. So let's talk about open wound management. And this is the fun stuff. So then we're actually getting to do the treatments on our wounds. Um, first and foremost, preventing further contamination. Um, we always want to make sure we're covering the wounds if you're stabilizing that patient. So Again, these wounds often accompany other injuries. So if it was a hit by car, maybe they're very critical and they're coming in and, you know, um, and you're stabilizing them for their shocky state um, or um, something along, along those lines. But in those situations, again, just put, a, put some gauze on and wrap it with some vet wrap or take a, a pee pad and wrap a pee pad around it. But anything you can do to just keep it covered is great because we all know that there are bacteria in the hospital, um, no matter what we do. And so preventing some of our bacteria to get in there is going to be very, really beneficial. Make sure that you're regularly cleaning your tables and you're wearing your gloves using aseptic technique. If you have an animal come in, a patient come in with a wound, go ahead and start broad spectrum antibiotics. I, I you know, um, I like Unison as my first go-to for any sort of um, wound um, because it's a good broad spectrum at that point, uh, and that will be the the antibiotic that we're with. And then, of course you'll submit your culture and make sure that it's an appropriate antibiotic. So um, some things to keep in mind, you know, this is me all the time um, and uh, we need to make sure that we are not doing this, that we are putting our gloves on and that we're not touching wounds and, and taking bandages off with our fingers exposed. Um, we wanna make sure we're, we're not um, introducing any bacteria into that wound. <clears throat> 
Um, we want to make sure we remove foreign contamination. So first and foremost, we need to clip our patient's hair. That we all we have very hairy patients, and so we need to get rid of all that hair. The hair, you know, definitely is going to be pro-inflammatory. It's going to, you know, trap all that exudate and nasty stuff and um, bacteria. And so we want to make sure we're able to get all that hair cleaned away. Placing some lube in the wound first is beneficial because then the hair will get caught in the lube and you can wash that off. Um, make sure you shave wide. And this is especially important if you've had a patient like a Yorkie or, you know, the little, the little dogs that just got chomped on because you'd be amazed at how many small other puncture wounds you find when you just keep shaving. Um, but make sure you give yourself plenty of room to work. Um, you want to make sure you have plenty of room around those wounds. And then whenever you're now getting ready to do your either assessment or, um, you know, first explore or whatever, you want to make sure you scrub around the wound and you can use um, a scrub or you can use a solution. Either way is fine, but we like to clean the skin and that skin has bacteria. It has exudate. Um, it's kind of gross and yucky. And so we want to, we want to clean all that stuff off and I'll do the this pretty much almost every single bandage change, unless it's been, a, it's a, the wound is very far along um, and there's very minimal exudate at that point. Um, but it is nice to get that on and you don't have to scrub hard, just nice, gentle um, motion on the skin and, um, and, and, and really it's contact time. So, you know, that's the most important thing is having that antiseptic um, actually in contact with the skin, cleaning it off. So just take your time, gently clean around. And then we, we don't put the, the solution or the scrub in the wound because the, um, the chlorhexidine or um, iodine, whatever you're using um, is actually toxic to fibroblasts. So it can slow or um, uh, affect that wound healing process. So we actually try not to actually get it into the wound. We just wanna clean around the wound. And then the next most important step um, is lavage. And when we lavage, we want to do all kinds of good things for that wound. We want to rehydrate tissue. We want to reduce bacterial numbers. We want to remove any debris and foreign contamination. We want to remove the actual wound exudate products, those cytokines and things, um, and maybe even remnants of your wound dressing. Um, my favorite way to clean a wound is the bulb syringe and bowl. It's so efficient. Um, and easy. I am not a fan of drawing, um, you know, lavage out with a syringe and then smooshing it. It's just, um, I hate that whole process. It drives me bonkers. Um, you can certainly hang um, a bag of fluids and spike it and have a slam bag. And that can be a fairly fast way too. Um, but regardless, you want to make sure you lavage plenty. You can't really over lavage. Um, and lavaging with um, an isotonic solution is going to be best. So um, studies have shown that LRS is probably the best one that you can use, but saline is fine as well. And then if you have a contaminated wound um, uh, or, or even potentially a wound that's fairly far along in your wound healing process, um, Tap water is okay to use too, you know? Um, so I, I don't shy away from tap water. Um, I prefer to use sterile solutions when I can, but, um, but I've used plenty of tap water in my career as well. Um, but, um, but again, lavage is so, so important, especially initially after a wound as well. So let's say you have a patient and they're not stable. They have, they, you know, it was a dog bite wound. Um, they're not doing well at all but you have all these open wounds, you might not be able to explore them. Maybe they're not, they're not stable enough to explore, but what you can do is you can just lavage things. And that that's good because again, um, there's lots of studies that show that initial lavage is going to be very beneficial at reducing those bacterial numbers. Actually, lots of studies from combat situations. Um, you know, one of the most important first steps they'll do is that lavage. 
Um, so again, copious volumes, pressure, people talk about that it needs to be a certain pressure and pressure does help, but it's not the end all be all. So, you know, for me, I, um, you know, I, again, I think that bulb syringe is nice. So in the first video, you saw us kind of wash the soap away from around the skin. And now we're just going to focus our efforts right on the wound bed itself and just do nice, nice flushing. And then the next step is debridement. And debridement is so important because if you have necrotic tissue there, it is going to prevent that wound from healing. It is going to prolong the inflammatory phase and you will not progress. It will be a nidus for bacteria um, and, um, and, and you are going to have a situation where things just won't heal. Um, and sometimes that debridement can be scary because you're cutting into structures that you don't think you should cut into um, and you're cutting away muscle or um, fascia, um, you know, maybe big areas of skin. And so then that gives you, um, you know, some caution about how you're going to get it closed. But at the end of the day, if it's dead, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not going to magically come back to life. So you've got to get rid of it. Um, I'm not saying just start chopping everything away. You know, oftentimes if it's questionable, give it a day. Um, but if it's obviously dead, go ahead and cut it off. You know, so this is a patient that um, had a big, um, uh, avulsion injury and had um, the flank fold and uh, caudal abdominal skin here, um, where it was um, again an avulsion injury. Uh, it was sutured up um, initially um, and then came in, and this was all dead. Um, so when you look in the pocket here, you can see that that skin is no longer viable. So, you know, one of the first things that we did was just cut that skin away um, because dead skin's not going to help that thing heal. So we had to get rid of that. There's lots of ways in which you can do debridement. Um, when I'm debriding a wound um, right after the injury, oftentimes I'll use some scissors, some Metzenbaum scissors, and I'll just cut the, the dead tissue away with that. Um, some people like to use a scalpel blade. I'm not much of a scraper, but some people will scrape certain areas. I'd rather just cut it off um, rather than um, try to, to scrape some of that area. Um, how are you going to choose what you remove again, you know, uh, think about, you know, what it looks like. Usually if it looks black, white, gray, those are areas that you can go ahead and debride and resect off. Um, and you'll just cut back until it's healthy. Um, sometimes if it's an area that looks questionable, I might take a marker and draw around that area and then look at the, the look at it the next day and see what it looks like. When you are um, doing some of your debridement, one thing to keep in mind is, is where your cutaneous trunk eye muscle is. So if you have skin, a big skin flap that's up here um, and you're debriding underneath that, if you cut away um, all the cutaneous trunk eye, you might cause the skin to die. So, um, because again, we have to remember that the blood supply is in that subdermal plexus, which is in your cutaneous trunk eye muscle. So think about that when you're doing your debridement, um, you know, so you don't accidentally cause, um, you know, that area of the skin to lose its blood supply. And then staged debridement, it's not, you know, you're, you might not be able to see all the stuff that's going to be dead. You debride it, it looks good the next day, maybe you're going to need to do a little bit more debridement. So be prepared for that, especially in those um, injuries where you have the compression and tension forces. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a dog that um, came in and he um, was a, he was a cat killer. Unfortunately, he would go out in his yard and he would, um, hunt barn cats and he, he killed a cat about three days before this. And, um, and, or maybe it was maybe four, but what, regardless, um, and then, and then right after he had some puncture wounds and then his face got really swollen and essentially developed a necrotizing fasciitis and all the skin on his, on his head died. 
Um, and, um, and so this is, you know, one of those moments where you think, you know, what are we going to do, you know, with, with all this tissue? Um, and, 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 and as you looked at it, as we started to explore, we recognized that most of it was dead. So, um, so although, again, it may seem very scary, um, we, you know, we have to debride and get rid of that. And, you know, this is a situation where now you're going to have um, some very, very challenging conversations with the clients, because you have to recognize, they have to recognize, you know, the gravity of the situation, because this is something that is not going to be, um, uh, you know, a wound that would heal by second intention. So you're definitely going to be planning on doing some sort of tertiary closure. Um, and then obviously we already have infection. So we're going to have to do ongoing wound management for a while beforehand, make sure that we've got our cultures and we're using appropriate antibiotics before we even consider, you know, um, uh, you know, a closure scenario. Um, and then we need to do ongoing um, assessments to see if anything else is going to die now that we've done our initial debridement. Um, this is the dog's Actually, his eye is right here. His um, upper eyelid margin, it was right here. Um, so we could actually, you could still, he had one little bit of upper eyelid margin, which was great. And, and we were able to, to save this dog, um, you know, with, with, um, with patience, um, a lot of money. The, fortunately for him, his, his family had money and, um, and, um, and, uh, and a lot of, um, you know, day-to-day -day open wound management and reconstruction. So um, finally, then once we've done our debridement, we want to promote a vascular bed. And what we mean by that is choosing a bandaging technique that's, that's going to promote the healing process to take place. So how can we do that? How can we get this to heal appropriately? First and foremost, we need to have a good primary layer that we think is going to be appropriate for what the, that wound needs. We need to be able to get remove the exudate. You know, we don't want that nasty wound fluid to sit there. Um, we need to allow the body to provide ongoing debridement. We might need to provide ongoing debridement. Um, and then we want to protect the surface of the open wound. So we want to make sure it's not exposed. And then we want to stimulate healing and formation of granulation tissue. So um, oftentimes we'll then augment this with some topical agents. So the primary layer, this is the first layer that's in contact with the wound. Um, it stimulates wound healing and it protects the wound and it should be sterile. So, um, so you want to think about that when you're choosing for what you're going to lay down in that. And the primary layer and the topical agents are two different things, but they get put together um, and we can use those guys together. Uh, and that really is, is beneficial and awesome. And we'll do that all the time. And when we think about the primary layer, essentially there's just two big basic categories. We have the adherent, which is your wet to dry, which is kind of the old school, been around for forever. It's still a great way to manage wounds, but it's not one that we use very often or for a very long time. Um, so wet to dry bandages are essentially gauze, lap sponges, um, and really, these are going to be times in which you have a wound that's in the inflammatory phase of healing, or if you have a wound that's infected or highly contaminated, that's when you're going to choose to use an adherent primary layer. Otherwise, the majority of the time we use non-adherent primary layers. So these are primary layers that are occlusive to semi-occlusive that fall under the category of what's, what's referred to as moist wound healing. And this is going to be anytime you have a surgical wound, anytime you have granulation tissue or an epithelializing wound. So this is going to be the majority of our wounds. So almost always we're going to go with the non-adherent. Again, wet to dries are still, they still have um, some good function, but, but use caution. I think um, most people are, are recommending to get away from wet to dries for the most part. So, um, when we think about um, 
you know, putting our primary layer on. Um, this is our wound that we had lavaged. We've got some sterile gauze. I always like to take a sterile gauze and just gently wipe the surface of the wound off. There's usually um, some film that's there. So I like to kind of just gently clean that away. So we'll wipe that off. Um, and then we're gonna wanna put um, our primary layer on. So this, um, this guy is gonna get an alginate, a calcium alginate. So this is a calcium alginate pad. You can get them in various sizes. Um, oftentimes what I'll do is I get them in bigger sizes. And when I size it up for the patient that I need, then the portion that I don't use, I put back into the package and then I'll use that the next day. So I can usually try to save some money that way. Um, and, I'll, and, and I try to optimize using that, that, that one section of, of primary layer that I'm using. Um, and, um, and, and so again, in that you saw an alginate, um, I like these, um, when, when wounds are in the inflammatory phase and when they're in the early repair phase, I use a lot of alginates. Um, it's made from seaweed. Again, you can get it in a mat. Um, they do make it in ropes, but mostly I just buy the bigger mats. Um, and then what happens is the fluid from the wound actually comes into that um, mat and it turns it into a gel. Um, and it helps the body autolytic debridement. It has really good fluid absorption and you change it when you have strike through. So, so um, with any sort of moisture retentive dress, dressing or the moist wound healing process, you're gonna be changing these um, when you need to based on how effusive they are. Um, hydrocolloids um, are another primary layer that um, I'll use pretty frequently. Um, again, they um, they come in a variety of um, of products, sheets, paste, powders. Usually, again, I just buy the sheet, and then um, you can put that hydrocolloid directly onto the wound. Um, it's going to provide a pretty nice occlusive layer, promotes autolytic debridement. You change when strike through is present, and um, again, I like in the inflammatory or repair phase. Hydrogels um, uh, are another um, primary layer that you can use. Um, you can get these in a, a number of products where you can actually get them where they're just gels. So you can actually use it as a, as a topical agent as well. So you can mix it with some stuff. Um, they don't have as good of absorption. So I tend to use these more in the repair or match phase. So further along when you don't have quite as much um, exudate. I also like hydrogels a lot with burn wounds. So I use these guys all the time. Um, foam. I love foam. Foam products are out there and you can actually get foam impregnated with antimicrobials. Um, and so I like the antimicrobial foams. Um, you can actually get some um, some foams impregnated with silver, so all kinds of things. Um, so I like the foams. There's a new foam out there too right now that ha is a, it's like a very purple color and, um, and they, and it will turn white if there's bacteria in the wound. So it has this bio indicator, which is kind of neat too. So, um, so foams are really nice. Um, again, I'll use these once I'm in that repair phase um, and the wounds are becoming a little less effusive. Um, adaptics, uh, these are the in, um, petroleum impregnated gauze. And we'll use those um, definitely over closed incisions or late stages of healing. Um, and so if you have really healthy granulation tissue, we might throw an adaptic on top of that. Um, there are biologics. So um, interesting things that are also being used. So um, SIS has been reported collagen, um, fish skin. We've used some of this fish skin um, uh, on a handful of cases. So essentially you just um, cut it to fit the shape of your wound. And then in theory, um, that fish skin is getting incorporated and it might speed up the healing process. And so um, that's also an option out there. Once you've got your primary layer on, then you're going to put your secondary layer. And that is essentially going to um, function to 
to absorb all your eggs you date. It can never be too big, um, especially if, you know, if you've got a very effusive wound. What you don't want is for your bandage to get soaked and drenched, and then, then it's going to be really nasty. So you definitely want a really nice amount of absorbent layer. Um, and also, if you're bandaging on an extremity, um, that absorbent layer can also help to immobilize that leg um, so that then um, it will help um, help in in keeping them from being less mobile, which might help with some of the wound healing um, and some of the uh, orthopedic injury healing as well. Um, so this is that same patient. And, you know, in this case, we're taking some lap sponges. And so um, we're just wrapping the lap sponges around um, to help provide absorption right over the area. Um, and uh, we're just choosing to wrap it because it will make it easier to, to bandage rather than laying it right on top. But we on that as well, um, you know, and certainly you get creative as you do these things. Um, and uh, sometimes you'll change it up based on, you know, what you're seeing and what you like. So that's that absorbent layer. And then again, in this situation, because it's on the extremity, we're then going to use um, our cast padding to then put a modified Robert Jones on. So a lot of different ways in which we're going to get our bandage to then stay on. And on an extremity, a modified Robert Jones is definitely one of the easiest ways in which you're going to get that bandage to stay on. So um, we'll put that on. On the trunk, oftentimes we might opt for, um, you know, a tie over bandage. Um, finally, you have your tertiary layer, which is that outer protective layer. It supports and keeps the other layers in place. It provides compression if you need it. Um, so this is your cling gauze and then vet wrap. Um, and then again, different ways in which you can get your bandages to stay on. Modified Robert Jones for extremities, tie overs. I use a lot of adhesive dressings as well. So um, Ioban is one brand name, but there's lots of different adhesive dressings that are out there. And essentially it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a sticky, um, a sticky adhesive layer that you just stick to the skin nearby and then you go over top of the the bandage so we'll look at some pictures of those tie over bandage tips and tricks use big gauge suture you know so for most dogs i'm going to use ought um, in very small dogs and cats i might use two ought um, but bigger gauge suture it definitely works better less likely to pull through the skin as quickly. Um, you want to make sure you're placing them at least five centimeters from your wound edge. Um, what I see oftentimes as a mistake is people are putting them super close to the wound edge and that's not going to help our wound edges actually adhere down. Um, so we want to make sure we're far from those wound edges and then place matching pairs, you know, so you're always going to have an even number of um, suture tags. Um, place them frequent. It is nice to have more. You don't want a bandage to fall off. You, last thing you want is to spend all this time and then have the owner come back two hours later, you know, at closing time and, and the bandage fell off and you've got to redo it. Um, and then I usually um, tie a knot after each time I go through. So um, a lot of times you'll see where people will lace it up kind of like a shoelace and lace, 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 and that's fine. But after you do each loop, make a knot and then do the next one and make a knot. And that helps it from not slipping. It helps it stay on a little bit more secure. Um, so this is, um, you know, a patient that has tie over bandage. So you can see we've got ample sutures placed around, lots and lots of sutures placed around um, the wound and they're not right in your wound edge either. Um, and then this is, you know, our stay sutures. Um, and you can see we've got multiple knots. I didn't place as many knots. Um, when I do tie overs, I do like to cut a piece of drape and put the drape on top. And that is my tertiary layer. So that's the, it's kind of a little less permeable. So it maybe keeps it a little bit cleaner as well. Um, the cross your heart bandage, that works pretty well too. Um, so sometimes we'll use that if the wounds are around the, um, the sternum, chest region, things like that. Sometimes on some of these cervical bite wound dogs, um, 
if you place these as kind of like a turtleneck, also wrap it around the arms, that helps it. And then you can wrap it around the ears, that helps it. And then sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually take the bandage and I'll just put a couple staples um, and staple the bandage just to the forehead. And that helps it stay in place as well. And those staples are easy to take, take off um, when you do the next bandage change. So um, getting into topical agents, um, honey is one that I think everyone knows about and um, most people really um, like it and have seen a lot of, you know, positive results from it. It's definitely one that I use a lot as well. Um, and I choose to use it in wounds that um, are early in the inflammatory phase, um, early in the repair phase. Um, and in wounds that have a lot of cellulitis. So, you know, I'm, if I'm seeing a wound and the peri wound skin looks really red and it's really thickened and there's all this cellulitis, uh, honey is gonna be my go-to topical agent in that case um, because it really helps pull uh, the fluid from the wound and it helps um, that osmotic effect of pulling everything in. It's also um, a broad spectrum antibacterial. Um, and so it can certainly help with uh, any infection that that's there. Um, it is an energy source. It has all kinds of other benefits. And then finally, depending on the type of honey that you have, um, it can have some antioxidant properties. And so um, if you've used honey, um, you may have heard of Manuka honey. And Manuka honey is the honey that's been studied. And it's the one that um, is thought to have this antioxidant effect because it's um, honey from uh, bees that are pollinating tea trees. Um, and so, um, so that is where you can, you can see some of that benefit. Now, do you have to use that type of honey? No, you can use any honey. Um, there are primary layers that have the honey actually already impregnated in it, which is super nice. Um, or you can have a tub of honey that you use. But as with anything, if you're using a multi-dosing uh, system, you need to make sure that you're using a system that doesn't contaminate it. Because certainly if you um, contaminated that with bacteria, then you could you could have a situation that would be a little um, um, messy because now you're maybe putting bacteria into wounds instead. So um, you can get sterile tongue depressors. So in cases where we do use the multi-dose ones, um, we get sterile tongue depressors or sometimes we'll get like a little um, clean um, specimen cup and we might scoop some out into there and then that becomes that patient's jar. So just some strategies to think about when you, do, um, when you are gonna use a multi-dose um, jar. So this is, this is a situation where we use the multi-dose jar. We had um, the specimen cup where we just used it for this patient. And so that we've got that primary layer of our um, alginate. And now we're just taking our honey and we're spreading that on there. And then that honey goes right in the uh, direct contact. And honey can be a little painful. Um, so when you do put honey on a wound, um, if your patient's not sedated, you might notice that they, um, that they jerk or something. It does burn a little bit. Other topical agents. There are antibiotics that we use. Um, and there are gels that sometimes hold these, um, or you can use them directly, um, but all kinds of, um, of antibiotics that can be beneficial. Um, some people like antiseptics. If sorry, you, I'm oh. having trouble hearing you. Oops, sorry, my watch started talking. Um, if you use an antiseptic like uh, chlorhexidine um, or iodine, uh, one of the big things to keep in mind is that you need to make sure you dilute it down um, to an appropriate concentration that does not inhibit your fibroblasts. And so um, I, again, I, I'm not a huge um, user of antiseptics in the wound, but some people are um, just, you know, caution and make sure you're, you're diluting it down so that you're not the wound healing process. Um, and um, 
Otherwise, other things, aloe vera, ace manin, um, these can be nice things, especially for when you have burns or partial thickness injuries. Um, you can apply these topically to those areas um, and they can um, have some anti-inflammatory, um, they stimulate healing um, and, and, um, and they can be beneficial as well. So, um, so in summary of all of our, you know, options for, um, you know, uh, choosing the various layers and things like that, um, if you have a contaminated or an infected wound, you can use an adherent or non-adherent. So, um, you know, those would be the times where you'd kind of think about, well, do I want to use an adherent? Um, if you have a clean or a surgical wound, you definitely want to use a non-adherent type um, layer. And then if you have healthy granulation tissue or epithelialization, you definitely want to use a non-adherent. So, um, so, you know, base that, you know, on, you know, what those, op what options you have available. And, you know, I think it is really important too, to, um, to think about having a range of things in your practice. You don't have to buy, you know, a huge box of each thing, but have some alginates, um, have some foam, you know, have some topical agents there. Because again, you know, listen to your wound, you might need to change up your primary layer. If you've been seeing good progression, and then all of a sudden, now you're starting to see your wound effusion increase again, or, you know, all of a sudden, you've been measuring your wound, and it's stopping you might want to change up your primary layer and um, try something different in that situation. All right, so listen to your wound. So these are, um, this is one case in the video somehow got turned around, that's really weird. So this is a, a dog bite wound, it's a, it's a small puppy. Um, and this is, uh, these are, puncture wounds over the thoracic cavity. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can see the animals breathing and, and it's an open chest wound. So this was one we were going to just talk about as an option. So, you know, in this case, what would you do? Um, it is a wound that just happened, um, but it obviously generated some tension force, some compression force. So we know at this point that there were some pretty um, significant forces to, to cause this wound. We can see a flap of skin that's been um, created here. Um, but we have um, obviously uh, a situation where we where we have, you know, a, an opening into the thoracic cavity. So in this situation, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do, you know, do we need to explore the chest? Um, you know, what are our options? So the way I would approach this is I would start by anesthetizing this patient and, um, and I would cover that wound and then I would, you know, clip and clean the area around the, where the wound is. Um, and then I would lavage, 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 lavage. And then I would place a chest tube. And then in this situation, I would probably not close anything yet. So one option would be to place a vacuum bandage. So we can use um, a foam layer, then an adhesive layer and continuous suction. And so that would be a nice way um, to provide, um, you know, to provide a closure so that you could maintain negative pressure in the chest. Um, another option would be just to use an adhesive bandage. So not use vacuum, not use suction, but just an adhesive bandage. But I would, I would probably manage this open for a few days before, before, just to, before determining when I would close this. And, and if at any point it started to look purulent in the, in the fluid that I was pulling from the chest, then we would probably go ahead and do an intercostal thoracotomy, open that up and, um, and explore the chest. Um, the case on the right here, um, is an animal that came in, you know, with this wound. Um, so, you know, what do we think about this? How can we describe this wound? Right. So if we're doing our wound assessment, 
So I think first and foremost, what we look at when you look at the peri wound skin, look at how red, look at how how um, edematous and um, and and irregular it is. So it's it, there's a lot of cellulitis. We can see necrotic tissue. So this, this is just dead skin right here. Um, so we know we have necrotic tissue, um, but we can also see there's some granulation tissue. So that tells us that this has been going on for a little while. Usually, you know, we think about granulation tissue forming somewhere around three to five days. So something happened and then the dead tissue has been sitting over top of it. And, um, and so, you know, what are we going to do in this situation? And, um, and, you know, I think first and foremost, we have to get rid of the dead stuff, right? Debridement. So we need to debride and then we need to lavage and then we need to promote a vascular bed. So, you know, it, it, you know, we don't need to get overwhelmed. We just have to take it step by step. So um, we're gonna debride this, we're gonna take our culture and um, then we're gonna lavage and then we're gonna pick a primary layer. So, you know, with this much cellulitis and evidence of infection, we might choose honey as a topical agent. We might choose alginate as our primary layer. Um, you could go with um, a foam as well. I think either or would be fine. Um, and then, and then we're going to start open wound management. So we would do this. And then the next day, the very next day, we would then change it and we would see what sort of response we got from that. All right, um, so that's the end of this. I've got some more case examples if you guys wanna go through that, but I, I think this would be a good time to stop and see if there's any questions, um, if anybody wants to talk about anything. Uh, Dr. Ham, you do have one question. Great. Um, Dr. Pinkwasser is asking, do you have much experience with the use of maggots? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I have not used medical grade maggots. Um, I've seen lots of pictures and I have a colleague who um, went on a phase of using them and, um, and I've not used maggots. I have used leeches a handful of times in um, cases where animals had um, vascular congestion after wounds, um, especially wounds where there was some sort of maybe tourniquet effect. So, so that was kind of neat to use um, something, you know, a, not the same because we're not using it for debridement, but, um, but still, you know, using um, a medical grade uh, creature and, and you, um, to get those, you, you fill out a prescription. Um, and, and um, at least at Ohio State, when I was there, we just went to the med center and they had them in their pharmacy. We just wrote a prescription and they would give us our leeches. And um, it was really interesting. So, um, but the, the maggots are, I think, a really interesting way to think about how you can debride something. And obviously it's nature's way of debriding. Um, you know, when you get some of those, those cases, um, sometimes those maggots can do a nice job, but, um, but I, honestly, I think, you know, surgical debridement usually works pretty well um, for the most part. Um, do you have any experience using them? Let's see if I can unmute Dr. Pinkwasser. Yes, I have. I've used it one. I used it on one patient once. And how, what'd you think? How'd it go? I I loved it. I loved it. And honestly, it's I don't see many wounds that are this bad. Um, but if I have another one, I'll go right back to it. it I think it worked better than surgical. I think it was quicker oh, wow. um, for the patient. Um, in people, from what I understand, they report a little bit of a um, like a tingling burn for the first day or two mm -hmm. because the maggots are actually crawling and they have a rough surface uh, along the lines of like a cat's tongue. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the mechanical debridement that they give. Oh, wow. Huh. Um, so, but yeah, I loved it. It was hard for me to get. I, I would love to be able to get them a little easier. I had to like call all around. I don't even remember. I have to look where I got them, but 
they worked phenomenally. Did you get the ones where they're in the little pouch? So you just no, 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 not the pouch ones. These were the ones that go right on the surface. Um, from what I was doing with the research, the pouch ones don't work as well because they stay in the pouch. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't, don't get, get as the of mechanical, an you only get the enzymatic. Mm. So no, these were where you put them on the surface. Now, when you use them, you have to bandage right around the edge of where the normal tissue meets the bad tissue. Okay. So. Ah, that's very interesting. Well, thanks for sharing. No problem. I'm gonna have to try them. I'm gonna, well, I'll have to look to see if our pharmacy here carries them too. I might ask about that tomorrow and see how easy it would be to get them. Yeah, I had a, I had a bit of difficulty getting them, so. Yeah, I can imagine it's probably not something that's <laughs> you can't walk into Publix and get them. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, all right. Any other questions out there? All right. Well, um, we can go through. I've got um, uh, another um, presentation that just has um, some cases that we can go through. Um, all right, so, um, so this is a dog, um, a female dog, a six-year-old female intact golden. Um, she's feeling lethargic and hyporexic and she had a C, oh wait, can you guys see this or no? Uh, right now we're just seeing. Oh, here, let me, I need to reshare. New share. All right. There you go. All right. Excellent. Good deal. <clears throat> All right. So um, she had a C-section five days ago. So um, this is the patient here. Um, so if you guys see that, um, obviously what you can see is her mammary tissue looks very infected. There are areas that look that are look like there's necrosis and um, and uh, necrotic tissue. You can see an opening um, on midline near where the incision was um, in the smaller picture, um, and you can see purulent discharges coming out. So. You know, at this point, I think we um, would want to describe what we're seeing. Um, and, you know, most likely we're dealing with a pretty nasty type of mastitis. And so, you know, what are you going to do in this situation? You know, do you treat this dog with antibiotics? Um, do you do you flush this um, and and bandage it? Um, or do you need to do some debridement? And, um, you know, in this case, I think, um, you know, we have enough evidence that there is some pretty necrotic tissue. Um, there's some pocketing there that I would want to explore. So, so I would start by, by debridement. Um, so um, we'll skip some of this stuff. <laughs> so again, we're going to think about all these things that we talked about, the mechanism of the wound, the forces, the phases of wound healing, the type of wound, um, you know, our patient assessment and all that stuff. And then we're going to choose what we're going to do. Um, so in this case, um, again, I think um, we'll skip ahead. Um, as we explored that area, you could see more of that was opening up along where her incision was. Um, so we went ahead and did a debridement. So um, in this case, we excised that area of mammary tissue that was unhealthy. So then would you close this afterwards? What would you do? Um, you know, so going back to some of the things we talked about, that peri wound skin looks terrible, right? Um, and, I, and on top of that, we 
we don't know what type of uh, bacteria are growing here. Um, so this is a case where after debridement, we probably want to go ahead and um, do open wound management. So debride, culture, start empirical antibiotics, um, manage her pain. But certainly I think, um, you know, we're probably not going to want to close this up. If we close it right now, when there's active infection, um, when the peri wound skin is not healthy, we more than likely would have this thing fall apart on us again. So this is what it looks like after debridement. We went ahead and um, removed that area. Um, and, um, and then did our tie over bandage. So this is what she looks like afterwards when we've got our tie over bandage on. Um, and um, one of the things we didn't talk about is, you know, when, when should we change a bandage? And, you know, I think we referenced that a little bit, but for the most part, we have to think about the type of bandage that we have on. So wet to dry bandages have to be changed every day, without a doubt. Otherwise, they lose their function and sometimes even a couple times a day. Um, but otherwise, there's no set standard. It's really going to be based on the amount of exudate, the stage of wound healing, if you need to do more debridement. So you're going to need to think about all those and take that into consideration. Um, and so um, when we um, did her bandage change the next day, so this is day two, um, we can see that we've got some granulation tissue forming. Um, her peri wound tissue was looking a lot better. Um, she had a moderate, moderate amount of um, discharge on her bandage, but we definitely still have some necrotic tissue there. So we're going to go ahead and debride that and we're going to put her bandage back on. So, um, and then we continued her, her, um, her open wound management for five days. And then we went ahead and closed her. And so once we knew that that peri wound tissue looked good, you can see how healthy that skin looks now. Um, we um, also at that point had her culture results back. So um, we felt comfortable that we had her on the appropriate antibiotics um, and we closed her up and she did great. And, um, and so that's, that's, you know, a good, a good um, example of, you know, when you are going to use a, a delayed um, primary. So this is not a situation where you're going to um, close it right away. We definitely need to get everything under control first. Um, so dog fight. Um, so this is a guy um, that was attacked by the neighborhood dog. Um, and she has puncture wounds all over the limb. Um, and so you have full thickness puncture wounds and oh. then um, you have deep, deep wounds um, to the um, tissue, um, you know, in that area, the muscle. Um, and then you can see the peri wound skin looks, looks really, really awful as well. Um, so when we're assessing this, you know, this is again, something where, um, you know, because of the forces that were generated in creating this and the amount of time that has gone on, um, and then the assessment of the wound, um, this is one where we're definitely not going to close. We're going to manage this as an open wound. Um, so, you know, we're going to do some debridement to clean it up, and then we're going to put a bandage on um, and manage her um, as an open wound um, and take our culture. That way, again, we're going to be able to see which antibiotic is going to be best. Um, and we're going to, um, you know, just continue to manage that until you know, things are looking healthier. And um, this is, if you look at the picture on the far right, um, you can see in the wound, it looks like there's some um, weird, you know, gel. That's what the alginate looks like um, when it, when it absorbs the wound fluid. So oftentimes when you do a bandage change after you, you've used the alginate, it, it might even look like like a brown pus that comes out it, and, and, you know, the first time you do it, you think, oh no, this is really bad, but it's just the alginate. Um, and, you know, and you'll clean that away and, um, and it's um, not too bad. Um, so just keep that in mind um, if you haven't used it before.
So, you know, um, what we can see, you can see over time, look at how the skin looks so much better day after day after you manage these and you manage them open and you, um, and you take care of them and you flush them and you get appropriate antibiotics and all of that. And so you can really see um, that over time, that tissue becomes healthier and healthier and is going to be ready to, to, um, to, for closure. So, um, so that's great. So once we get to a point where we feel like um, it's ready for closure, then we can think about how we're going to get that closed. So, um, you know, is it something where we can close it primarily? Or is it something where we might have to, um, you know, move skin around? Another thing to keep in mind when you finally go to close these wounds is, um, when granulation tissue forms, granulation tissue has zero holding strength. So if you go to put suture into um, an area with granulation tissue, it'll just pull right through. Um, or if you think that then you've got a secure closure, it's just going to fall apart on you. So um, you got to think about how to get um, a hold of some strong subcutaneous um, tissue. And oftentimes, if you're closing a wound when you're doing a delayed primary, you might in your subcutaneous sutures, you might actually need to get a little snippet of your intradermal. You might need to hook a little bit of that intradermal to really get something that's going to hold it together. Now you have to be careful because if you have tension, you know, it's going to fall apart. So now you fix the infection, but if tension is there, it's going to fall apart. So you gotta, you gotta think about, um, you know, whether you're going to be able to do that. So if you see here, you can see getting a nice big bite of that subcutaneous tissue. So you can grab and you're going to get big, big bites and you're going to get in that healthy grant, that healthy subcutaneous tissue. Um, but if you try to do it in, in, um, in, uh, granulation tissue, it's not going to hold. And then once you get that nice, strong subcutaneous tissue closed, then you're going to be able to get your skin together. Um, and, uh, and, and, um, and that will heal appropriately. And that nice sub Q too is going to make it so that that skin is opposed with no tension. Um, all right. So, you know, oftentimes if we close in the middle, we might then bisect that again and, and see if we can, um, you know, um, bring that together in bits. So, um, so that's this guy closed up. Um, here's another case. We've got a two-year-old female spade pit bull mix. Um, she has five acres of space and she was found with this large wound 20 minutes ago. So um, who knows what happened? Um, you know, you can only, um, you can only uh, imagine, um, but, uh, but pretty significant depth, um, certainly in this, in this situation. So um, when we explore the wound, you know, we can see that this just happened. It's very fresh. Um, and we have, um, you know, this um, flap of skin that's avulsed here, um, but this mostly looks like a laceration type injury. Um, it looks like something that may have been fairly cleanly created, um, you know, so, um, you know, we need to think about you know, some features that are different from this wound from our mammary. And one is certainly time. Um, you know, the mammary, the mammary uh, mastitis case had necrotic tissue. It had an active infection. It was dirty versus this guy. It's a contaminated injury. Um, so um, we can think about, you know, the, the, you know, the potential um, to get this guy closed a lot faster because we don't have an active infection at this point. So um, we know we have contamination. Um, so in this case, we can um, think about, um, you know, how we're going to manage this. And, um, <laughs> and I'm just going to skip through some of these. Um, and get to the punchline here. All right. So again, we talked about that subdermal um, plexus. 
So when we think about this chunk of skin that's been avulsed here, right? You know, we think about, is that going to live or not? You know, do we want to suture this back down? The chances of that staying alive are probably not great. So um, we have to take that into consideration. And if that skin is not viable, um, then, um, then it's not going to, um, you know, do us any good by leaving it there. So, you know, in this situation, if we think that something is dead, we're going to debride it. Um, in this case, we went ahead and placed a, a vac drain as well. Um, so this is just a picture of that. Um, it ha it's a foam that you place in the wound. Um, and then it attaches to a tube that goes to the unit that applies negative pressure. And then you have to have this adhesive dressing. So this is just an example of, um, of a um, negative um, pressure wound therapy um, bandage, which is pretty nice. Um, they're, um, they're great devices to use. Um, and so we can do open wound management for a while, and then we can go ahead and get that guy closed up. Um, so again, a situation where it looks very daunting and intimidating, um, but in that case, you know, by, by managing it for a few days um, with open wound management, it looks much healthier and it's going to have a much better chance of success in, clo in staying closed. So, um, all right, well, um, I think we'll stop there. We'll see if there's any questions, any other questions that have popped up in the meantime. Uh, you've got one question, actually more of a comment, uh, Dr. Vinoski. Um, don't forget laser, it works. That's his comment. Oh, yes, yeah. You know, I didn't include um, some of the, the um, adjuncts to wound healing, but hyperbaric, laser, excellent. I'm so glad you brought that up. So there's lots of fun things that we can do to help augment the wound healing process. So we've got our principles of wound healing that we can't forget and the, the principles of open wound management. But then if you've got access to, to laser therapy or hyperbaric, those things can definitely be beneficial um, in speeding up that process and helping with comfort and things like that as well. Thank you. All right, guys, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Just go ahead and click it, type in your question, and uh, we'll answer it live. Um, if there's any part of tonight's lecture that um, you, you weren't quite sure about, you want to go back, you want to hear something again, um, we will be posting this lecture on, uh, on the website. Actually, we have our own YouTube page. Um, so the website will take you over to our private YouTube page. Um, so you guys can watch it there again. Or if you know somebody that uh, couldn't make it tonight, um, let them know that they can, they can watch it. Uh, unfortunately, there is no CE credit for, um, for watching it after the fact, uh, only for those of you who are here with us tonight. All right, uh, again, any questions? And I can, um, if you guys want, um, I can give you my email address. If you ever have any wounds or cases that you want to chat about, I'm always um, uh, happy to help out or give an, give an opinion about something. Um, my email address is uh, hamk at ufl.edu. So hamk at ufl.edu. Um, so if you did have any questions about tonight's um, talk, uh, you, can, you can reach out to me that way as well. All right, well, um, I don't see any more questions um, in the queue. So with that said, I think we're going to uh, call it a night. We're gonna say thank you to everybody for, uh, for joining us tonight. Our next lecture is going to be on March 4th. Um, and we're gonna be discussing intestinal parasites. Uh, Dr. Nagamori from Zoetis is gonna be talking about parasites and some new um, uh, artificial intelligence ways of uh, diagnosing uh, intestinal parasites. So should be interesting. Um, with that said, I wish you guys all a good night and we'll see you in a month. Be happy, be healthy. <laughs>
Absolutely. 